Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we are going to conclude our reading of The Man Who Was Thursday by G.K. Chesterton. Mr. Thursday is Gabriel Syme, police infiltrator of a circle of anarchists. Only all the other people in the circle are also infiltrators, except for Sunday. And they have been chasing Sunday across the countryside, and most recently he has gone up in a balloon. Up and then down. Look, cried out Bull clamorously, the balloon is coming down. There was no need to cry out to Syme, who had never taken his eyes off it. He saw the great luminous globe suddenly stagger in the sky, right itself, and then sink slowly behind the trees like a setting sun. The man called Gogol, who had hardly spoken through all their weary travels, suddenly threw up his hands like a lost spirit. He's dead, he cried, and now I know he was my friend, my friend in the dark. Dead, snorted the secretary. You will not find him dead easily. If he had been tipped out of the car, we shall find him rolling as a colt rolls in a field, kicking his legs for fun. Clashing his hooves, said the professor. The colts do, and so did Pan. Pan again, said Bull irritably. You seem to think Pan is everything. So he is, said the professor. In Greek, he means everything. Don't forget, said the secretary, looking down, that he also means panic. Syme had stood there without hearing any of the exclamations. It fell over there, he said shortly. Let us follow it. Then he added, with an indescribable gesture, Oh, if he has cheated us all by getting killed, it would be like one of his larks. He strode off toward the distant trees with a new energy, his rags and ribbons fluttering in the wind. The others followed him in a more footsore and dubious manner, and almost at the same moment all six men realized that they were not alone in the little field. Across the square of turf a tall man was advancing toward them, leaning on a strange long staff like a scepter. He was clad in a fine but old-fashioned suit with knee breeches. Its color was that shade between blue, violet, and gray which can be seen in certain shadows of the woodland. His hair was whitish-gray, and at first glance, taken along with his knee breeches, looked as if it was powdered. His advance was very quiet, but for the silver frost upon his head he might have been one of the shadows of the wood. Gentlemen, he said, my master has a carriage waiting for you in the road just by. Who is your master? asked Syme, standing quite still. I was told you knew his name, said the man respectfully. There was a silence, and then the secretary said, Where is this carriage? It has been waiting only a few moments, said the stranger. My master has only just come home. Syme looked left and right upon the patch of green field in which he found himself. The hedges were ordinary hedges. The trees seemed ordinary trees. Yet he felt like a man entrapped in fairyland. He looked the mysterious ambassador up and down, but he could discover nothing except that the man's coat was the exact color of the purple shadows, and that the man's face was the exact color of the red and brown and golden sky. Show us the place, said Syme briefly, and without a word the man in the violet coat turned his back and walked toward a gap in the hedge, which let in sufficiently the light of a white road. As the six wanderers broke out upon this thoroughfare, they saw the white road blocked by what looked like a long row of carriages, such a row of carriages as might close the approach to some house in Park Lane. Along the side of these carriages stood a rank of splendid servants, all dressed in the grey-blue uniform, and all having a certain quality of stateliness and freedom which would not commonly belong to the servants of a gentleman, but rather to the officials and ambassadors of a great king. There were no less than six carriages waiting, one for each of the tattered and miserable band. All the attendants, as if in court dress, wore swords, and each man crawled into his carriage as they drew, and as each man crawled into his carriage, they drew them and saluted with a sudden blaze of steel. What can it all mean? asked Bull of Syme as they separated. Is this another joke of Sunday's? I don't know, said Syme as he sank wearily back in the cushions of his carriage. But if it is, it's one of the jokes you talk about. It's a good-natured one. The six adventurers had passed through many adventures, but not one had carried them so utterly off their feet as this last adventure of comfort. They had all become inured to things going roughly, 
but things suddenly going smoothly swamped them. They could not even feebly imagine what the carriages were. It was enough for them to know that they were carriages, and carriages with cushions. They could not conceive who the old man was who had led them, but it was quite enough to know that he certainly led them to the carriages. Syme drove through a drifting darkness of trees in utter abandonment. It was typical of him that while he had carried his bearded chin forward fiercely so long as anything could be done, when the whole business was taken out of his hands, he fell back on the cushions in a frank collapse. Very gradually and very vaguely, he realized into what rich roads the carriage was taking him. He saw that they passed the stone gates of what might have been a park, that they began gradually to climb a hill, which, while wooded on both sides, was somewhat more orderly than a forest. Then there began to grow upon him, as upon a man slowly waking from a healthy sleep, a pleasure in everything. He felt that the hedges were what hedges should be, living walls, that a hedge is like a human army, disciplined but all the more alive. He saw high elms behind the hedges, and vaguely thought how happy boys would be climbing there. Then his carriage took a turn of the path, and he saw suddenly and quietly, like a long, low sunset cloud, a long, low house, mellow in the mild light of sunset. All the six friends compared notes afterward and quarreled, but they all agreed that in some unaccountable way the place reminded them of their boyhood. It was either this elm top or that crooked path, it was either this scrap of orchard or that shape of a window, but each man of them declared that he could remember this place before he could remember his mother. When the carriages eventually rolled up to a large, low, cavernous gateway, another man in the same uniform, but wearing a silver star on the gray breast of his coat, came out to meet them. This impressive person said to the bewildered Syme, Refreshments are provided for you in your room. Syme, under the influence of the same mesmeric sleep of amazement, went up the large oaken stairs after the respectful attendant. He entered a splendid suite of apartments that seemed to be designed specially for him. He walked up to a long mirror with the ordinary instinct of his class to pull his tie straight or to smooth his hair, and there he saw the frightful figure that he was, blood running down his face from where the bow had struck him, his hair standing out like yellow rags of rank grass, his clothes torn into long wavering tatters. At once the whole enigma sprang up simply as the question of how he had got there and how he was to get out again. Exactly at the same moment, a man in blue, who had been appointed as his valet, said very solemnly, I have put out your clothes, sir. Clothes, said Syme sardonically, I have no clothes except these. And he lifted two long strips of his frock coat in fascinating festoons and made a movement as if to twirl like a ballet girl. My master asks me to say, said the attendant, that there is a fancy ball, fi that there is a fancy dress ball tonight, and that he desires you to put on the costume that I have laid out. Meanwhile, sir, there is a bottle of burgundy and some cold pheasant, which he hopes you will not refuse, as it is some hours before supper. Cold pheasant is a good thing, said Syme reflectively, and burgundy is a spanking good thing. But really, I do not want either of them so much as I want to know what the devil all this means, and what sort of costume you've got laid out for me. Where is it? The servant lifted off a kind of ottoman a long peacock blue drapery, rather of the nature of a domino, on the front of which was emblazoned a large golden sun, and which was splashed here and there with flaming stars and crescents. You are to be dressed as Thursday, sir, said the valet, somewhat affably. Dressed as Thursday, said Syme in meditation. It doesn't sound a warm costume. Oh, yes, sir, said the other eagerly. The Thursday costume is quite warm, sir. It fastens up to the chin. Well, I don't understand anything, said Syme, sighing. I have been used so long to uncomfortable adventures that comfortable adventures knock me out. Still, I may be allowed to ask why I should be particularly like Thursday in a green frock spotted all over with the sun and moon. Those orbs, I think, shine on other days. I once saw the moon on Tuesday, I remember. Beg pardon, sir, said the valet. Bible also provided for you. And with a respectful and rigid finger, he pointed out a passage in the first chapter of Genesis. 
Syme reading it wondering. It was that in which the fourth day of the week is associated with the creation of the sun and moon. This is getting wilder and wilder, said Syme as he sat down in a chair. Who are these people who provide cold pheasant and burgundy and green clothes and Bibles? Do they provide everything? Yes, sir, everything, said the attendant gravely. Shall I help you on with your costume? Oh, hitch the bally thing on, said Syme impatiently. But though he affected to despise the mummery, he felt a curious freedom and naturalness in his movements as the blue and gold garment fell about him, and when he found that he was to wear a sword, it stirred boyish dreams. As he passed out of the room, he flung the folds across his shoulder with a gesture, his sword stood out at an angle, and he had all the swagger of a troubadour. For these disguises did not disguise, but reveal. Chapter 15 the Accuser. As Syme strode along the corridor, he saw the secretary standing at the top of a great flight of stairs. The man had never looked so noble. He was draped in a long robe of starless black, down the center of which fell a band or broad stripe of pure white, like a single shaft of light. The whole looked like some very severe ecclesiastical vestment. There was no need for Syme to search his memory or the Bible in order to remember that the first day of creation marked the mere creation of light out of darkness. The vestment itself would alone have suggested the symbol, and Syme felt also how perfectly this pattern of pure white and black expressed the soul of the pale and austere secretary with his inhuman veracity and his cold frenzy, which made him so easily make war on the anarchists and yet so easily pass for one of them. Syme was scarcely surprised to notice that amid all the ease and hospitality of their new surroundings, this man's eyes were still alert. No smell of ale or orchards could make the secretary cease to ask a reasonable question. If Syme had been able to see himself, he would have realized that he too seemed for the first time himself and no one else. For if the secretary stood for that philosopher who loves the original and formless light, Syme was a type of the poet who seeks always to make the light in special shapes, to split it up into sun and star. The philosopher may sometimes love the infinite. The poet always loves the finite. For him, the great moment is not the creation of light, but the creation of the sun and moon. As they descended the broad stairs together, they overtook Radcliffe, who was clad in spring green like a huntsman, and the pattern upon whose garment was a great tangle of trees. For he stood for that third day on which the earth and green things were made, and his square, sensible face with its not unfriendly cynicism seemed appropriate enough to it. They were led out of another broad and low gateway into a very large old English garden full of torches and bonfires, by the broken light of which a vast carnival of people were dancing in motley dress. Syme seemed to see every shape in nature imitated in some crazy costume. There was a man dressed as a windmill with enormous sails, a man dressed as an elephant, a man dressed as a balloon. The two last together seemed to take, keep the thread of their farcical adventures. Syme even saw, with a queer thrill, one dancer dressed like an enormous hornbill with a beak twice as big as himself, the queer bird which had fixed itself on his fancy like a living question while he was rushing down the long road of the zoological gardens. There were a thousand other such objects, however. There was a dancing lamppost, a dancing apple tree, a dancing ship. One would have thought that the untamable tune of some mad musician had set all the common objects of field and street dancing an eternal jig. And long afterwards, when Syme was middle-aged and at rest, he could never see one of those particular objects, a lamppost or an apple tree or a windmill, without thinking that it was a strayed reveler from that revel of masquerade. On one side of this lawn, alive with dancers, was a sort of green bank, like the terrace in such old-fashioned gardens. Along this, in a kind of crescent, stood seven great chairs, the thrones of the seven days. Gogol and Dr. Bull were already in their seats. The professor was just mounting to his. Gogol, or Tuesday, had his simplicity well symbolized by a dress designed upon the division of the waters, a dress that separated upon his forehead and fell to his feet, gray and silver like a sheet of rain. 
The professor, whose day was that on which the birds and fishes, the ruder forms of life, were created, had a dress of dim purple over which sprawled goggle-eyed fishes and outrageous tropical birds, the union in him of unfathomable fancy and of doubt. Dr. Bull, the last day of creation, wore a coat covered with heraldic animals in red and gold, and on his crest a man rampant. He lay back in his chair with a broad smile, the picture of an optimist in his element. One by one the wanderers ascended the bank and sat in their strange seats. As each of them sat down, a roar of enthusiasm rose from the carnival, such as that with which crowds receive kings. Cups were clashed and torches shaken, and feathered hats flung in the air. The men for whom these thrones were reserved were men crowned with some extraordinary laurels, but the central chair was empty. Syme was on the left hand of it, and the secretary on the right. The secretary looked across the empty throne at Syme and said, compressing his lips, We do not know yet that he is not dead in a field. Almost as Syme heard the words, he saw on the sea of human faces in front of him a frightful and beautiful alteration, as if heaven had opened behind his head. But Sunday had only passed silently along the front like a shadow, and had sat in the central chair. He was draped plainly in a pure and terrible white, and his hair was like a silver flame on his forehead. For a long time, it seemed for hours, that huge masquerade of mankind swayed and stamped in front of them to marching and exultant music. Every couple dancing seemed a separate romance. It might be a fairy dancing with a pillar box or a peasant girl dancing with the moon, but in each case it was somehow as absurd as Alice in Wonderland, yet as grave and kind as a love story. At last, however, the thick crowd began to thin itself. Couples strolled away into the garden walks or began to drift toward that end of the building where stood smoking in huge pots like fish kettles some hot and scented mixtures of old ale or wine. Above all these, upon a sort of black framework on the roof of the house, roared in its iron basket a gigantic bonfire which lit up the land for miles. It flung the homely effect of firelight over the face of vast forests of gray or brown, and yet it seemed to fill with warmth even the emptiness of upper night. Yet this also, after a time, was allowed to grow fainter. The dim groups gathered more and more round the great cauldrons, or passed laughing and clattering into the inner passages of that ancient house. Soon there were only some ten loiterers in the garden, soon only four. Finally, the last stray merrymaker ran into the house, whooping to his companions. The fire faded, and the slow, strong stars came out, and the seven strange men were left alone like seven stone statues on their chairs of stone. Not one of them had spoken a word. They seemed in no haste to do so, but heard in silence the hum of insects and the distant song of one bird. Then Sunday spoke but so dreamily that he might have been continuing a conversation rather than beginning one. We will eat and drink later, he said. Let us remain together a little, we who have loved each other so sadly and have fought so long. I seem to remember only centuries of heroic war in which you were always heroes, epic on epic, Iliad on Iliad, and you always brothers in arms. Whether it was but recently, for time is nothing, or at the beginning of the world, I sent you out to war. I sat in the darkness where there is not any created thing, and to you I was only a voice commanding valor and an, unnatu and an unnatural virtue. You heard the voice in the dark, and you never heard it again. The sun in heaven denied it, the earth and sky denied it, all human wisdom denied it, and when I met you in the daylight, I denied it myself. Syme stirred sharply in his seat, but otherwise there was silence, and the incomprehensible went on. But you were men. You did not forget your secret honor, though the whole cosmos turned an engine of torture to tear it out of you. I know how near you were to hell. I know how you, Thursday, crossed swords with King Satan, and how you, Wednesday, named me in the hour without hope. There was complete silence in the starlit garden, and then the black-browed secretary, implacable, turned in his chair towards Sunday and said in a harsh voice, Who and what are you? I am the Sabbath, said the other without moving. 
I am the peace of God. The secretary started up and stood crushing his costly robe in his hand. I know what you mean, he cried, and that is exactly that I cannot forgive you. I know you are contentment, optimism, what do they call the thing, an ultimate reconciliation. Well, I am not reconciled. If you were the man in the dark room, why were you also Sunday, an offense to the sunlight? If you were from the first our father and our friend, why were you also our greatest enemy? We wept, we fled in terror, the iron entered into our souls, and you are the peace of God? Oh, I can forgive God his anger, though it destroyed nations, but I cannot forgive him his peace. Sunday answered not a word, but very slowly he turned his face of stone upon Syme, as if asking a question. No, said Syme, I do not feel fierce like that. I am grateful to you, not only for wine and hospitality here, but for many a fine scamper and free fight. But I should like to know. My soul and my heart are as happy and quiet here in this old garden, but my reason is still crying out. I should like to know. Sunday looked at Radcliffe, whose clear voice said, It seems so silly that you should have been on both sides and fought yourself. Bull said, I understand nothing, but I am happy. In fact, I am going to sleep. I am not happy, said the professor with his head in his hands, because I do not understand. You let me stray a little too near to hell. And then Gogol said, with the absolute simplicity of a child, I wish I knew why I was hurt so much. Still Sunday said nothing, but only sat with his mighty chin upon his hand and gazed at the distance. Then at last he said, I have heard your complaints in order, and here I think comes another to complain, and we will hear him also. The falling fire in the great crescent threw a last long gleam like a bar of burning gold across the dim grass. Against this fiery band was outlined in utter black the advancing legs of a black-clad figure. He seemed to have a fine close suit with knee breeches, such as that which was worn by the servants of the house, only that it was not blue, but of this absolute sable. He had, like the servants, a kind of sword by his side. It was only when he came quite close to the crescent of the seven and flung up his face to look at them that Syme saw, with thunderstruck clearness, that the face was the broad, almost ape-like face of his old friend Gregory, with its rank red hair and its insulting smile. "'Gregory!' gasped Syme, half rising from his seat. "'Why, this is the real anarchist!' "'Yes,' said Gregory, with a great and dangerous restraint. "'I am the real anarchist.' "'And there came a day,' murmured Bull, who seemed really to have fallen asleep, when the sons of God came before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. "'You are right,' said Gregory, and gazed all round. "'I am a destroyer. I would destroy the world if I could.' A sense of pathos far under the earth stirred up in Syme, and he suddenly broke, and, and he spoke brokenly and without sequence. "'Oh, most unhappy man,' he cried, "'try to be happy. You have red hair like your sister.' My red hair, like red flames, shall burn up the world, said Gregory. I thought I hated everything more than common men can hate anything, but I find that I do not hate everything so much as I hate you. I never hated you, said Syme very sadly. Then out of this unintelligible creature the last thunders broke. You, he cried, you never hated because you never lived. I know what you are all like from first to last. You are the people in power. You are the police, the great, fat, smiling men in blue and buttons. You are the law, and you have never been broken. But is there a free soul alive that does not long to break you only because you have never been broken? We in revolt talk all kinds of nonsense, doubtless, about this crime or that crime of the government. It is all folly. The only crime of the government is that it governs. The unpardon unpardonable sin of the supreme power is that it is supreme. I do not curse you for being cruel. I do not curse you, though I might, for being kind. I curse you for being safe. You sit in your chairs of stone and have never come down from them. You are the seven angels of heaven, and you have had no troubles. 
Oh, I could forgive you everything, you that rule all mankind, if I could feel for once that you had suffered one hour a real agony such as I... Syme sprang to his feet, shaking from head to foot. I see everything, he cried, everything that there is. Why does each thing on earth war against each other thing? Why does each small thing in the world have to fight against the world itself? Why does a fly have to fight the whole universe? Why does a dandelion have to fight the whole universe? For the same reason that I had to be alone in the dreadful council of days, so that each thing that obeys law may have the glory and isolation of the anarchist, so that each man fighting for order may be as brave and good a man as the dynamiter, so that the real lie of Satan may be flung back in the face of this blasphemer, so that by tears and torture we may earn the right to say to this man, you lie. No agonies can be too great to buy the right to say to this accuser, we also have suffered. It is not true that we have never been broken. We have been broken upon the wheel. It is not true that we have never descended from these thrones. We have descended into hell. We were complaining of unforgettable miseries even at the very moment when this man entered insolently to accuse us of happiness. I repel the slander. We have not been happy. I can answer for every one of the great guards of law whom he is accused. At least, he turned his eyes so as to see suddenly the great face of Sunday, which wore a strange smile. Have you, he cried in a dreadful voice, have you ever suffered? As he gazed, the great face grew to an awful size, grew larger than the colossal mask of Memnon, which had made him scream as a child. It grew larger and larger, filling the whole sky. Then everything went black. Only in the blackness, before it entirely destroyed his brain, he seemed to hear a distant voice saying a commonplace text that he had heard somewhere. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? When men in books awake from a vision, they commonly find themselves in some place in which they might have fallen asleep. They yawn in a chair or lift themselves with bruised limbs from a field. Syme's experience was something much more psychologically strange, if there was indeed anything unreal in the earthly sense about the things he had gone through. For while he could always remember afterwards that he had swooned before the face of Sunday, he could not remember having ever come to at all. He could only remember that gradually and naturally he knew that he was and had been walking along a country lane with an easy and conversational companion. That companion had been a part of his recent drama. It was the red-haired poet Gregory. They were talking like old friends and were in the middle of a conversation about some triviality. But Syme could only feel an unnatural buoyancy in his body and a crystal simplicity in his mind that seemed to be superior to everything that he said or did. He felt he was in possession of some impossible good news which made every other thing a triviality, but an adorable triviality. Dawn was breaking over everything in colors at once clear and timid, as if nature made a first attempt at yellow, at a first attempt at rose. A breeze blew so clean and sweet that one could not think that it blew from the sky. It blew rather through some hole in the sky. Syme felt a simple surprise when he saw, rising all round him on both sides of the road, the red irregular buildings of Saffron Park. He had no idea that he had walked so near London. He walked by instinct along one white road on which early birds hopped and sang and found himself outside a fenced garden. There he saw the sister of Gregory, the girl with the gold-red hair, cutting lilac before breakfast with the great unconscious gravity of a girl. The End